neighbor guys fighting all drunk over some dumb shit. Just in our big apartments in the front. We seen them arguing and fighting, and then we seen them crack them in the head with the crowbar and all this shit, right? And blood, and people started like, you know, trying to help this guy out. And our parents have brought us in, you know? And then you could just see him there, like all in there, and all of a sudden it was like, he's dead. Like, you know, people were screaming, and his family's out there like, ah, you know? So it's real chaotic and crazy. And you can just see the meat, like, in his head just spread out. You saw his brains? Yeah. Split open, man. Uh, six. I get caught in my mind all the time wanting just to take myself back to the animal that, you know, kept me in survival mode my whole life. And I feel like that's inside of a lot of people that grow up in hard times and, you know, not so good families and have seen the things I've seen, um, just have violent intentions and it just plays back in your mind and I don't feel like like that is me and who I am, but I feel like it'll always be a part of me. And uh, I'm always going through like a mental fight with myself over it. Ranked into the Crips, um, sixth grade. I'm Hispanic, I look white. Uh, it's kind of hard growing up in the neighborhood. All the Mexican kids always wanted to kick my ass. And I found some homies, you know, black guys, white guys, Mexican guys, and accepted me and, and became a gangbanger overnight. Young, first things we were doing was breaking into cars, stealing minor things, smoking pot, going to the gas station, asking uh, people to buy us 40 ounces to, to drink. Uh, that's always like the first stuff we started doing. Um, as I started getting older and escalating, we started selling harder drugs, uh, you know, cocaine, crack. Um, and eventually, uh, we just became full-time drug dealers. Uh, and we also started robbing people. That was uh, like probably one of the crazier things I started getting into was uh, home invasions, tying people up, taking all the money, the drugs. And we did that for a long time. And um, I mean, that was probably the lowest part, lowest part of my life. But then my friends started dying on heroin, man, like all the time. Like, you know, I have 13 homies who probably died on heroin in the last 15 years, I've lost a lot of friends uh, due to drugs and they've lost their families and lives. And I mean, obviously the government's been bringing drugs through here since uh, the 80s. I mean, you know, there's not, a, there's not a drug dealer who owns an airplane or a boat that gets this stuff here. I mean, I've, I've lived here since mid 80s and it's always been a crack epidemic, 
heroin epidemic. You got now, now it's big with meth. I mean, there's no scientists here making uh, the meth. You know, it's it's the government, it's the people in power. I believe that uh, you know want to keep us down and keep this neighborhood what it is. And it's really sad, man. And it's been like this for years. This isn't. Uh, you know, five years, ten years, twenty years. This, this is going on as long as this neighborhood has been created. So I, I just ask, like, wh where are you guys at? Like, where's the help? Oh, people come into the tattoo shop and they're like, "Oh, can I speak to the owner?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." You're talking to him and they're like, oh, oh shit. Wow, You're so the owner? Wild, and I'm like, yeah. yeah, I'm the owner, man. <laughs> what is the owner? What is the owner supposed to look like? I had my son when I was 20 years old and um, took me a couple years of partying and fucking up when he was a baby to realize how much time and um, good times I was missing with him and uh, you know that pretty much set me to wanting to work harder to get a real job and uh, just become a man you know and uh, my I had a stepdad you know and he he really taught me how to work and uh, and to put effort in into life you know and into like nicer things and own things so I've always had that in the back of my mind is like you know I could do this you know I can I could be a regular person I can uh I can have a business, I can have a wife and kids and, you know, buy a home one day. And I just started hustling and climbing, man, and I, I just, I never looked back. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Five, zero, five, five, eight, six, one, zero, six, three is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Hola, mamá. Es Mateo. Está hablando para ver cómo andas. Hábleme para atrás, por favor. Te quedo. During COVID this last year, we, me and my buddy, uh, Josh Patterson, have opened up uh, No Paul Gallery. We opened this gallery with the intent to be our own destiny, our own business owners, to own our own things and to push art in the direction we wanted to go. We didn't need help from nobody, no government officials, no piggybacking off of anybody's name or money. We just did it on our own. And we're gonna push to get you know young artists in there to show culture and life of New Mexico and throughout the world. Here coming in January, we'll have free classes for kids uh, every Sunday. They'll be 100% free. They're not only going to be art classes, they're going to be music classes, music lessons. We're going to really bring a bunch of people together to help out kids, you know. And I, I want them all to be from, you know, that can't afford it. We want to facilitate a, a beautiful place for people to come and learn and vibe, man. It's, it's something great, you know. I'm between that, my tattoo shop, and the clothing, it's all in a retrospect of my life and my story. And I really just push it for my people. And I believe you Nopal know, Gallery is going to be something big for the, in the future and big for the people. And I promise that it's going to be one of the most significant things for the war zone in years.